So, vielen Dank für diese Einladung und ich werde versuchen, so laut wie möglich auf Englisch zu reden und dann danach äh, freue ich mich auf Ihre Fragen. Remarks on Kant's three unities of the subject, of the object and of subject and object together. Zuerst ein Zitat. Unsere Frage ist nicht nur die Frage nach der Einheit des Subjekts und auch nicht nur die Frage nach der Einheit des Objekts, je für sich selbst. Es ist vielmehr die Frage von der Einheit von Subjekt und Objekt miteinander, nämlich innerhalb der Welt. Seite 262. Um, now my talk has four parts, background, then secondly a little bit on the critical approach in general, thirdly, on Prowse's approach, uh, I'll leave some pages out, and then, if there's time, the fourth part on the infinite. So part one, some background. There are a number of very different approaches to the complex classical problems of empirical knowledge and the unity of the subject, of the object, and of subject and object together. My goal is simply to sketch, with respect to this complex of problems, a brief, very introductory and historical systematic comparison between some other still prevalent non-Kantian approaches in modern philosophy and Kant's own critical approach. In order then to highlight just a few basic features of the modified critical position elaborated in Gerald Proust's most recent and most impressively ambitious account, Die Einheit von Subjekt und Objekt. Two still dominant analytic approaches to these problems, which have reigned in various uh, and numerous variations ever since Hume and Hobbes are, as you know, psychologism and physicalism. Psychologism is originally a very austere, I call it a bottom-up philosophical approach, moving from mere sensory impressions to associations of pale ideas and reinforced expectations. It classically takes the form of a phenomenalism that has the supposed epistemological advantage of affirming no more than is immediately empirically present and supposed ontological advantage of minimalistically not adding transcendent entities of any kind. In this respect, that is simply in having some kind of minimalist initial orientation and non-supernatural final orientation, it has some very limited analogy to Proust's project. I mention it because he uses this notion of a minimalist approach. The traditional psychologistic position is obviously a non-starter, though, for those who accept any substantive pure knowledge. And with regard to empirical knowledge as well, its highly austere approach faces considerable problems. In contrast to the common sense and also the critical threefold empirical belief in and assertion of a real subject, a real separate object, and a real interaction between them, the traditional austere Humean is limited to offering an error theory, that is a strictly psychological account of how these beliefs in real entities are generated as mere fictions from a base of originally disconnected sensory impressions. On closer inspection though, even the key term here, impression, Eindruck, which is commonly used in this tradition as if self-evident, is actually rather odd for rigorously psychologistic philosophy to invoke. One reason for this is because its literal meaning is rooted, as you know, in the ancient thought of the direct perception of a concrete causal impressing process, as with sealing wax, a process that takes place between items that are distinct and resembling, but precisely non-mental. Such a perception of what is external in this way is hardly something that a human can consistently presume we are capable of. Although non-humans, such as even Kant, sometimes also oddly pass over this difficulty by misleadingly suggesting that the origin of empirical concepts is not a serious or not especially serious philosophical problem. This is presumably because empirical concepts are then unfortunately thought to be originally explicable basically in terms of a process of reception and abstraction. Uh, Proust discusses this. There's also a discussion of this in a um, debate I've been having with Hannah Ginsburg recently, uh, and you might follow that up in uh, her response in the British Journal of uh, Aesthetics, which will be appearing very uh, soon. Uh, in the end, I think we agree on most things, but um, you can see some of the discussion there. So the idea is that uh, the concepts can be explained in terms of process of abstraction, as if our mind's eye could simply lift off resembling ideas from an external sensible form impressed upon it. Fortunately, at other times, 
Kant shows that he realizes that even in this empirical context, and so not only with regard to a priori concepts, it is not at all clear what the grounds are for claiming in this way even an ontological, let alone an epistemically accessible resemblance relation between representation and, and object. In addition, contrary to its own motivations, psychologism ultimately appears either to need to rely on a miracle of impressions originally arising from nowhere, or to have to presume a mysterious impression generator, a transcendent source for the existence of at least some given like impressions without which the principles of association would not even have a chance to begin to lead to a series of like ideas and appropriate expectations. Furthermore, these impressions, even to be able to lead to appropriate fictions, have to be generated not just somehow or other, but in an original, highly appropriate way, with sufficient affinity. Uh, you know the passage in the critique at A113, where Kant uh, reminds us of this point, to lead to our highly harmonious common beliefs. Hence, if a philosophical account is going to have to assume this much order anyway, it would seem that it might as well instead accept a real external world in the first place, albeit preferably not in the limited form of the naive realism of the era of G. E. Moore, but rather along the lines of some kind of critical account, as in what Proust calls his own explanatory realism, Eklebar Realismus, uh, which I think has some um, similarities to work by Putnam and others that you may recall from other contexts. This account is explanatory because it shows how a conception of distinct things can only be made sense of in relation to a subject's spontaneous and interpretive intentionality rather than by mere passive impressings and subconscious associations. Before further exploring the critical account, however, it should be noted that given psychologism's difficulties, it's rather the opposite non-critical or top-down and physicalistic approach that has become most popular in our time. This development is somewhat surprising because physicalism is a position that was very much a minority view in classical modern philosophy, and understandably so since the rise of modern science immediately generated the severe problem of how to relate our inner experience and the ordinary objects of the external world to the very different theoretical entities of the exact sciences. Although it generally tries simply to piggyback on the much vaunted practical successes of modern science, Contemporary physicalism is a philosophical position that still has its own severe epistemological and ontological difficulties. Again, even if one ignores special problems with accounting for standard cases of substantive pure knowledge. Clearly, as Proust and many others, including Kant, have reminded us, there's much ordinary empirical knowledge that existed for a long time before exact science, and that even now can exist independently of it. And so whatever knowledge claims are connected with the exact physical sciences, these would seem, at least in part, to have to be parasitic on much more elementary claims that still require an accounting. In addition, the term knowledge is not itself even a part of any exact science, and neither it nor essential related terms, such as judgment, normativity, justification, warrant, truth, and falsehood, have ever been non-question beggingly defined in terms of such science. Hence, Proust's repeated reminder of the necessity of a non-empirical philosophical treatment of the empirical. Furthermore, just as with psychologism, the question of the subject's distinctive unity as such, and hence of its relation to and unity with an object, cannot even be directly addressed by such sciences, since they do not literally refer to such a uh, subject, but typically promise some kind of eventual counterintuitive reduction of it to mere fiction. And even the notion of a merely physical object remains hardly resolved by modern science alone, because beyond the problem of scientifically incompatible interpretations of contemporary physical theories, there remains the specter of numerous alternative philosophical interpretations, some realist and some not, of whatever is now taken to be our most likely scientific story. So section two, toward a critical path. A very different and decidedly non-psychologistic and non-physicalistic account is to be found in the tradition of critical philosophy, although it too presents many problems of interpretation and justification, even on a charitable and moderate reading that is transcendently idealistic, while realistically still positing an irreducible subject, along with a separate object and a fundamental subject-object relation between them. And I give <laughs> references to uh, some of my work, but also there's a new book by Lucie Lez in Oxford that I think presents a somewhat similar view.
And it's a remarkable fact that for long periods, even in German thought, and circles not obsessed with either psychologism or physicalism, the critical approach seemed to be overshadowed by very popular and radical, often political or existential approaches that were preoccupied with other issues and disdainful of traditional epistemology and metaphysics. So in the first two-thirds of the 20th century, it seems to me there was a striking shortage of significant systematic defenders of Kant's own critical philosophy, even in his homeland. This sad development, of course, was due in no small part to political events, to the mocking or even exiling of pivotal earlier figures such as Husserl and Cassiar, and also to overreactions to some neo-Kantian conflations of critical philosophy with mere Wissenschaftstheorie. Thus it happened that in the final third of the 20th century, it appears that the resurgence of serious systematic interest worldwide in Kant was in large part due to the stimulus of what you might call outsiders, most notably P.F. Strawson and his analytic followers, and then in practical philosophy, John Rawls and his numerous successors, successors who unfortunately often eschewed thorough involvement with Kant's general epistemology and metaphysics. Strawson's approach, despite its now considerable distance from our own time, as well as all its differences with the classical German tradition, is still very much mentioning, I think, in relation to Proust's work. This is because Strawson, partially under the considerable influence then of the later Wittgenstein, also starts in his first major book, Individuals, with the, at that time, revolutionary fundamental notion of an active person, a finite being that is neither simply mental nor simply physical. His next book, The Bounds of Sense, was more explicitly Kantian, and stressing along these lines the first critique's innovative empirical realist approach to the external world problem. Strawson follows Kantian's spirit albeit an indirect and selective way, when he takes the key arguments of the transfer deduction and refutation of idealism to eschew private sense data, as well as reductive physicalism, as a foundation for empirical knowledge, and instead to stress, like Proust, that our mental life is from the start a matter of an inlimitable subject situating itself in a public spatial temporal framework. The fundamental epistemological and ontological unity of the empirical subject, of distinct empirical objects, and of an actual subject-object relation are all taken very seriously in Strawson's rejection of Leibnizian as well as psychologistic and physicalist approaches. By focusing on problems with the still popular idea of a mere sequence of private sense data and arguing that this idea by itself does not even leave room for any what he calls weighty distinction between mental acts and determinate contents of any sort, Strawson contended that a Humean representer could not even meaningfully Separate, so, separate itself from its field of representations. And this uh, language, I think, generated a whole generation of theories of meaning in this period, if you recall. Uh, and so it would dissolve into a disunity that is even less than a dream. Put more positively, a Strassonian person, and his point is that fundamentally we are all such persons, is a subject that can know even itself only through making a meaningful distinction between its own subjective temporal order of representings, similar to what Proust calls the begleitendus, and the spatial temporally organized order of represented items, the begleitetus, which has a stable meaning that is publicly determinable. This distinction requires the subject to be able to understand its own experience as a matter of tracing and determining one actual path among many other objectively possible ones within the world's encompassing three-dimensional framework. Note again that this is just another way of saying that there must be, at one and the same logical moment, an understanding that there is a genuine unity of each subject, a genuine unity of each object with an order for the whole of them, and in addition to these separate unities, a genuine unity of each subject and its object or objects. This last unity is not, however, a matter of total ontological identity, but signifies a correlative epistemic and at some point actual relation, for not every objective uh, that is independently structured representation had by a subject succeeds in revealing an actual external thing. And if you read Proust, you'll see he often makes this contrast between the objective uh, level of structure and then the actual level of posited existing things. Empirical error, error, that is failure in our objective perceptual intentions, is always possible, as Proust often emphasizes, whereas on the pre Wittgensteinian view that Strassen is criticizing in a somewhat similar way, there are no grounds for a genuine distinction between not getting it right and really getting it right because a bare sense datum is just whatever it seems to be and so is in no way external to the act of representing.
The fuller Kantian rejoinder, I take it, is that success in actual empirical knowledge requires at least a threefold recharacterization of experience as involving not mere sense data, but one, a subject's projection of objectively oriented intentions involving structured acts of imagination, the Eingebildetes, two, an ever more consistent sorting through a plurality of these in order to reveal the ones that coherently and truly disclose actual things in contrast to merely inner appearances, the Erscheinendes, and three, a regimentation of the sorting procedure by reference to constant features of pure forms which provide the skeleton of a stable public backdrop, a unified field of three-dimensional spatial temporal actuality within which each subject can locate the actual unity of its own life and acts of intending. It is not appropriate here to go too much further into de details of the Strassonian approach. The main point is simply to notice that just like Proust's work, it too displays a Kantian heritage by preserving a pronounced realist and critical stress on the threefold distinct unities of subject-object and the subject-object relation, although it does so, as Strassen does so, in a way that has been understandably criticized from a variety of angles. A common objection from those who regard positions such as psychologism as not so easily dismissible is that Strassen's own approach is too thin to account specifically for empirical knowledge. In other words, Strassen's austere reliance on what I think is primarily a mere act-content distinction, leaves his version of the critical approach without adequate resources to deflect the skeptical rejoinder that for all that the bounds of sense establishes, we might have nothing more than a sequence of external world beliefs, a situation not all that unlike a massive dream, and hence the specters of solipsism and skepticism may remain unresolved. In Anglophone circles, this critique is often been coupled with the assumption that any attempt to alleviate this problem by adding a reference to any version of transcendental idealism and the doctrine of Dinge an sich, which Strassen himself in any case went out of his way to avoid, would only exacerbate matters and make our representations and contrast seem what some people call fraudulent as a result. There's a phrase I think like this in, in McDowell and also uh, in a work by Alan Wood recently. At the same time, uh, let me reach for a drink here, excuse me. At the same time, from those who are instead more concerned with utilizing as much as possible from Kant's own text, the opposite objection has arisen that Strassen had to be vulnerable to the extent that he was trying to present critical arguments without explicitly invoking central thicker features of the critique itself, such as its arguments for specific categories and a full range of operator principles, all undergirded by some kind of transcendently ideal metaphysics. So section three is Proust's path, and I'll leave out some pages here since you, know, you can read the book um, to follow up. Um, many of these worries, which much preoccupied the Kantian world five decades ago, were already addressed in the most sophisticated manner at that time in Proust's Revolutionary Erscheinung by Kant, and then two related books uh, soon thereafter, one on the problem of the Ding an sich, and one on fundamental themes in epistemology. And I've dis discussed that latter book in an article in the 1980s. For all their influence and virtues, however, it is only in the later work, culminating now in the ambitious achievement of the Einheit volume, that a clear line of argument has been presented that goes far beyond the Strassonian strategy by focusing at length specifically on the critique's own starting point, namely the discussion of space and time that dominates the transcendental aesthetic, and using that to rethink Kant's whole notion of Erscheinung and experience in relation to our pure forms of sensibility. Revolutionary as the Einheit book is, in its basic conception of details, it's nonetheless helpful to understand that it continues to have significant parallels with other trends in more recent Anglo-American philosophy. These parallels arise, I take it, not from direct influence, but simply from the common ground of a number of perceptive minds simultaneously rethinking die Sachen selbst in light of the broader spirit of the critical approach. I have in mind in particular the massive and continuing influence of the school of Wilfred Sellers, a school influenced not only like Strassen's generation by, and here are three points, one by what can loosely be called the anti-Cartesianism of the late Wittgensteinian era in general, but also by two, a special combination of an appreciation of holistic arguments and the need to attack the myth of a given in a manner that now tends to be especially associated with Hegelianism. Some of you may also remember the uh, 
talk by Davidson at the Hegel uh, Kant Congress years ago in Stuttgart, which was part of this um, wave. And then three, a recognition of the need to engage, as Kant did in his time, more directly with the implications of contemporary science, and especially the relation of space and time to the basic peculiarities of human subjectivity. On a positive side, this has led to some very sophisticated recent readings of Kant's arguments, which are now often presented in Germany too, for example, in James Conant's criticism. Uh, and I have a, uh, also a reference to some work by Matthew Boyle in this uh, new collection of de Greuter on recent work in epistemology. Uh, Conant criticizes what he calls the layer cake conception of human mindedness, an attack that parallels extensive earlier work by other followers of Sellers, such as Robert Brandom, John McDowell, Robert Pippin, and even earlier Richard Rorty. Rorty was uh, Brandom's teacher, and then Sellers was Rorty's teacher, and uh, Pippin was uh, with me and uh, here with Proust in 1977-78, but uh, I also just recently learned that uh, he uh, took a course with Sellers in graduate school when uh, they were both in Pennsylvania years ago, so there are many common sources. The parallels here with the critical and Kantian approach derive, I believe, from the appreciation of a central point already stressed in the Shino book, namely that, a spontaneous intention, that spontaneous intentionality and synthesis are at the basis of all distinctively human experience, and contrary to some of the apparent suggestions of the A edition of the critique, they employ a number of distinct faculties in a way that should not be understood, as all too many readers have, I think especially in the Anglophone world, in terms of a quasi-Humean bottom-up and literally successive addition of mere complications. That is, the transcendental deduction's basic notion of, quote, synthesis of recognition in a concept, A103, which is central to its original characterization of apperception and judgment, cannot be intelligibly conceived as a third step in experience that's entirely separate from involvement with the material of intuition and the combinings of imagination. I think this was a major high point of the Ashino book by Prowse, and uh, near the same time, independently, there are articles by Sellers and Strawson, which emphasize the intertwining of imagination, perception, and the other uh, faculties. For surely, if these other components are not themselves already at some kind of epistemic rather than merely natural level, then the mere addition of a contrasting third factor cannot magically transform them into components of judgment. More positively, it has to be acknowledged that our intuitions themselves, in order to be cognitive relevant, are present from the start only through the specific a priori shapings of the unified forms of our mind, especially um, the first the forms of sensibility. Similarly, the pertinent basic unifying act of imagination and knowledge is not a matter of mere association or whimsy, but is just the concrete application of the faculty of understanding in the context of a particular sensible manifold at an empirical as well as a priori level. This is again uh, connected to B160 or in the Proust book, page 555. And at both levels, it's always guided by pure and not merely empirical forms. In other words, synthesis is not a matter of going through a merely contingent three-part temporal sequence of atomic elements as in adding multiple layers of a cake on top of each other, but as instead, one might say, an instantaneous punctual combination of components that make cognitive sense only in relation to each other uh, and the forms that govern these relations. This all might seem unintelligible were not for the fa simple fact that, as Kant often reminds us, we just do constantly recognize and reconstitute the distinction between, on the one hand, a mere sum or juxtaposition of representations, no matter how strongly bound by psychological associations, physical behavior, or brain connections, and on the other, the distinctive normative unity that is an act of judgment. These points are reiterated in the Einheit's book's careful critical discussion of the old proposal by Heidegger and others of the faculty of the imagination as a supposed independent third link connecting allegedly totally separate rather than merely distinct faculties of sensibility and understanding. This is just one of many issues where the central notion of primitive unity plays an enormous role. The most basic version of this notion, you recall, is one that's presented repeatedly in the Einheit book, namely the transcendental aesthetics claim which was also uh, anticipated in the um, ar uh, article on regions of space uh, in the 1760s, in regard to the original representations of space and of time, that these are each a whole that is a totem analyticum rather than a totem syntheticum. That is, each bit of space and each bit of time must be originally represented as portions of an all-inclusive space or time, 
for it's impossible non-circularly to make sense of the continuous infinite and all-inclusive features of either time or space by starting from mere individual, allegedly independent parts of them and then building up to larger ones. Confusions in reading Kant can arise on this score, for although he stresses the overall a priori unity of each of the representations of space and time themselves in the aesthetic, he goes on in later sections of the critique to discuss how our determination of concrete truths regarding particular things is a process of synthetically building up and combining parts together. And I think in addition to Proust, there's a good discussion of this in some not well-known later books by Arthur Melnick, which I think has more similarities with Proust than uh, most other books in English. But although the ever-expanding bits of knowledge that we can gain thereby and the physical things that correspond to them can be thought, at least to some extent, to be something like a matter of moving from parts to a whole, of seeing and adding together distinct layers of building blocks, this is not to deny that each particular synthetic process only makes sense insofar as there is from the very beginning in finite consciousness, although not yet in determinate knowledge, a unified a priori representation of an encompassing whole within, each, with, within which each step of such concrete progress always takes place. And I think one of the highlights of the Proust book is his distinction between the levels of consciousness and knowledge. He repeats that point often uh, very helpfully. Kant, does not, Kant himself does not always express his position clearly enough in this regard, however, and Proust does not hesitate to indicate that Kant often mischaracterizes his own critical perspective and also overlooks the pivotal roles of the specific concepts of point and extension, which ultimately underlie our representations of time and space. In particular, in regularly using the term putting together a Zusammensetzung for combinations of bits of space or time, Kant leaves open the unfortunate impression, quite inconsistent with his own deeper insights, that spaces and times themselves, like elements of a set of atomic individuals, can consist of pieces that somehow might be characterizable, even apart from their belonging to an all-encompassing continuum of extension. So the Einheit book moves, also moves far beyond Kant himself and his common interpreters by pursuing the basic but all too neglected additional question of how time and space relate to each other and of how we can and speak not only of each of their individual a priori unities but also their broad a priori unity together. In discussion of this unity, the Einheit book daringly argues that despite the organization of the aesthetics text which places space first it's nonetheless the representation of time that logically as well as methodologically should be placed first. So here I'll skip a couple pages. Uh, in the middle there I make a reference to, e, uh, to page 380, 392. Those are a couple of the very few places where in this book I saw Proust referring uh, directly to Husserl. It seems to me one could argue uh, that properly understood there's an enormous uh, parallel between what I think Proust is trying to do and the better parts of Husserl's uh, epistemology, uh, philosophy and phenomenology, especially a perception of things in space and time. In any case, this uh, epistemological relation of a universal subject-object unity of knowledge that is achieved in our process of uh, perception is just part of a broader unified realm of distinct fields of unity, an uh, encompassing ontological complex that Proust argues is only in part natural. That is, all the knowable objects of nature comprise one component, but the subject, as a spontaneous intentional agent, is not itself a merely causal natural object, and so the whole of object and subject together composes something all-inclusive that is not an entirely natural whole, although that is not to say it is supernatural either. As with Strawson, the acknowledgement of such a subject within a broader unified complex makes this position unlike classical physicalism, just as the acknowledgement of a related, distinct, unified, and actual physical domain makes it unlike classical psychologism. The objective dimension of the Proustian account contrasts with the latter position in acknowledging from the start a fundamental metaphysical receptivity that underlies our mental life, what he calls a cosmos that is the ground from which all contingent content for active spontaneity must develop. Furthermore, in contrast to uh, psychologism's miraculousness or inconsistent dependence on a hidden impression generator, our intentionality in Proust's account has built into it a receptivity to the Sachen selbst. The acknowledgement of this receptivity is in full harmony with healthy common sense, I think, and the original motivations of critical philosophy, for the very notion of intentionality is of an interpretive operation concerning material that is given to 
and not just created by finite subjectivity. Skipping a bit, I say, here as usual, Proust's terminology is very carefully chosen. For his reference to the ground of the Big Bang, of the Urkanal of our cosmos, is combined with an insistence that's misleading to think of the general underlying ground of experience literally in terms of what Kant calls Dinge, since the subject in its spontaneous intentionality is so unlike a natural thing, which can be defined simply in terms of its causal laws, the more general notion of den Sachen selbst needs to be introduced to cover the whole unified source of all the received contingent content of reality, for this concerns, concerns subjects as well as nature's things and their properties, all of which have to be characterized in relation to intentionality. I take this to be a kind of a revisionary suggestion because there are passages in Kant where he does, I think, refer to what underlies the subject as a ding an sich and rather than the Sacha language. Moreover, uh, because, well, let's see, I think I can skip a little more here and move to the last section then. Section four, <laughs> the absolutely infinite. To end on a broader concern of a very different kind, I cannot help but take the risk of shifting to ask on this occasion whether the Proustian project, as it has now been fleshed out in such rich cosmological and metaphysical detail, is truly best connected with Kant's project alone. The last parts of the book surely will generate for many readers the question of whether it is instead better understood as a new, albeit much phenomenologically and scientifically enriched, version of the later German idealist tradition, from Fichte through Hegel and Schelling, one which also includes parallel to Spinoza's notions that emerge in the influential discussion of space and time generated by Jacobi in 1789. One hesitates, of course, even to broach this kind of largely interpretive and historical point because the fundamentally, as you know, systematic character of Proust's work, along with his explicit departure even from Kant at many points, clearly indicate a philosophical approach in which mat what matters most is not where one's positions or arguments come from, but rather where they're going, that is how systematically convincing they are on their own. Nonetheless, possibly fruitful recollections of later idealism, and I should add, I myself do not espouse the Segalian later idealist position, but, but there may be some fruitful rec recollections of later idealist, uh, the later idealist position that appear inevitable when one sees how the Einheit book ends with an extensive section on how we are to think, despite all the considerable prior stress on our own spontaneous intentionality, of the finite subject as something embedded in the infinite, and moreover an infinite that must be thought of being as being responsible for a finite conscious subject whose comprehension of its situation as such is what fulfills the actualization of the original infinite being. Along this line, there's even a very striking footnote, six, page 609, uh, which allows that there may even be some analogy between this metaphysics and uh, theological Trinitarian doctrines, although, of course, only an analogy. Most surprisingly, it even turns out this may be the most remarkable sense in the whole, whole book, it even, or in all of his work. Most surprisingly, it even turns out that the ultimate unity of the Einheim book concerns what is provocatively called on page 609, and you'll enjoy getting to that page, it's a highlight. He calls it the autonomy of the cosmos itself, which has an ansich character that incorporates within itself responsibility for the whole realm of appearance. The result is an internal internal finitization, a selbstveränderlichung, in which the old phenomenal numeral distinction becomes expressed as an imminent relation of form to content with no reference to anything transcendent beyond the infinite continuous spinning out of the extensive domains of space and time uh, generated by the uh, cosmos and uh, operating through the mediating activity of spontaneous subjectivity. Such an overall picture, this is my last uh, page or so, a couple pages. Such an overall picture, intentionally or not, inevitably calls to mind the heterodox Jena metaphysics of Hegel and Schelling, for they both embed nature's potencies in a similar three-part story that begins with a literally infinite metaphysical ground, which is expressed in the amplitude of nature and then also in that part of concrete reality, which is spirit and its ultimate comprehending philosophical subject. Hegel's overall term for this logical process is die Idee, but he also stresses it's taking the basic form of the begriff, a term that Proust also utilizes when he characterizes the Sache selbst in terms of what is thought by the begriff, for example, page 216. Of course, Kant himself also makes many references to the infinite, and in positive, 
all-encompassing terms, but he distinguishes this merely theoretical thought or representation of metaphysical infin infin infinity from both an actual infinity and the full field of the eternal objects of our spatial temporal experience. Hegel, in contrast, you recall, follows Jacobi's suggestion that someone could argue that the infinity already granted to pure space and time as all-encompassing representations could be used in a Spinozist way to understand concrete things as finitizations of an infinite realm that has an imminent rather than supernatural ground. And there's also a use of the terms Bewegung and Wua in this uh, book, uh, which made some people recall uh, basic notions in, in Spinoza's doctrines. What Hegel adds, of course, is the thought that this ground needs to be grasped not only as substance, but also as subject, that is, as actualizing itself through a sequence of necessary determined negations that express a comp conceptual form comprehensible even by finite subjects, and that is, in fact, fulfilled through the very process of comprehension. In addition, Hegel contends, unlike Kant, that rather than being merely transcendently ideal and subject subjectivistically irreducible forms of the human mind, space and time can be deduced as unified necessary dimensions of the sock and subst, or at least of the presentation of the sock and subst. And his speculative logic even offers such an a priori deduction, a deduction that emphasizes, just as Paus does, that it's crucial to see this world as consisting of members, uh, he uses the word glied, glider very often, not mere parts. In Hegel, the notion of the member of the glied is connected to the uh, discussion of the organic and of life, and if uh, Herr Proust was, were here, I really would like to have asked him uh, what he thinks of this concept, which is so central in current discussions. All this appears especially relevant to the Einheit book because it also boldly presents what is called a de demonstration of the deductive requirement of temporal and spatial determination for reality as such. This point is still made in a critical spirit, to be sure, with reference to the well-known fact that unlike some previous philosophers, Kant proposes a deep distinction which is not merely a matter of degree between the forms of the faculty of the understanding and the temporal and spatial forms of the faculty of sensibility. And Professor Heidemann will develop this uh, point uh, more in his papers, I recall. Nonetheless, the question remains as to whether the general character of the Proustian project, bracketing, bracketing all its admittedly very important specific insights into geometry and contemporary theories of the continuum, is more in the spirit of Hegel's logic, uh, and, and perhaps even for good rather than dogmatic reasons, or whether the Proustian understanding of our faculties is nevertheless more in line with basic distinctions that Kant properly wanted to maintain. To my ear, this part of Proust's work has surprisingly, because I know he, elsewhere he constantly and very effectively criticizes Hegel. The book on the Stadt, for example, is, and there's a footnote kind of to that here, uh, shows how he continues to basically see weaknesses in Hegel's position. Uh, but uh, to my ear, this part has an even more Hegelian tone than Kantian tone when it emphasizes not only that the continuum is to be thought in uninterrupted rather than discreetly constructed terms, but also that this amounts to a kind of self-relation because components of continuous extension in time are not to be thought of as put together zusammengesetzt, but rather as hanging together, zusammenhängend mit sich. I want to add a quote that's not in this version. I just forgot to put it in, but it's from... Uh, a. Uh, w. Moore, Adrian Moore, over in Oxford's book on the infinite, 2001, page 158, uh, uh, one chapter Moore says, points are precisely where lines do things. He goes on to say, points are precisely where lines do such things as stop. And he talks about how they also then build up surfaces and so forth. And then he ends by saying, by extending this principle, might, we might eventually be led to the somewhat Hegelian thought that the whole is non-derivatively real. Anything less is an aspect of the whole, where it does something. But we are now in the realm of the metaphysically infinite, end of quote. So here's another uh, writer, uh, independently of my reading of Proust, who makes this connection between the notion of uh, points and the continuum and uh, Hegel. Uh, just a couple more sentences. Similarly, Proust's claim to deduce the subject predicate form as a condition of making assertions about three-dimensional things with two-dimensional properties can be seen as an answer in part to an objection that Hegel raised to Kant's incomplete metaphysical deduction of categories. In the end, then, perhaps the reader might not be blamed for speculating, admittedly mischievously, that something of a more and more Hegelian approach lies behind Proust's suggestion that, despite their difference, there is a common root behind our diverse faculties after all, and in particular that this heretofore hidden root seems to be very much like late idealism's ultimate absolute, namely the infinite continuum. <laughs>
And perhaps as a final speculation, this is one why one finds in the title of Krauss's book the two critical words, Kant's Probleme. Thank you.